Hello everyone and welcome back to part two of this week's episode. Pete Jones from Betfair here and I'm joined by a political betting expert, Tavis Rendell, who will be the US Electoral College, discuss which states the election will be won and lost and recommend some potential betting opportunities. Tavis, thanks for joining us once again. How about you start by explaining the 270 to win concept and why this number is significant? Absolutely, Pete. Thank you for having me back here again. So for your first time observers, international observers, or even if you're a longtime veteran of American politics and you want a refresher, it's always helpful for, to review our electoral system, one of the most unique in the world. First thing you want to keep in mind is it is not the individual with the most votes that becomes the president. Pretty, pretty hard fact, fact to get your mind around, but it, but it remains the case of, and the foundation of our system here. It's not how many votes you get, it's where you win your votes. And so as a result of this, four times in American history, we've had an individual who's received less votes become the president of the United States. This has happened recently twice in the past 20 years. First with uh, George W. Bush defeating Al Gore. Al Gore won the nationwide vote by a little over half a million. George W. Bush went on to become the president. Donald Trump, most recently, in the most pronounced example of this in 2016, lost a nationwide popular vote to Hillary Clinton by almost 3 million votes, but won enough states in the Electoral College in the right places, he went on to become the president. So you can get a lot of, uh, lot of upsets here, and even, even in a race where a candidate could be leading by four or five, maybe even six points, it still could be within the margin of error for an upset to occur, and it, it's part of what makes this thing so exciting all the way down to the end. How about we pull up the uh, US electoral map here? Um, and perhaps the first, um, first question I have for you is um, uh, maybe you can explain just how the total votes per state are determined. Um, is there an exact science to this? Um, for example, is it in proportion to the population of each state? Uh, the answer is yes to both questions, Pete. Uh, there is an exact science to it, and uh, states are weighted to, to population without going into a, a four hour mathematical explanation here. What you, want, what you want to bear in mind here is the states with the most population in the United States have the most electoral votes. They are not equally weighted, however, commensurate with our population. So the three most populous states, as you'll see on the map here of, of the United States, are California, Texas, followed by Florida. They have the most votes in order, 55, 38, and 29, respectively. Uh, the, lowest, the lowest number of electoral votes any state can possibly have is three. The least populous states have, of the United States have, have three electoral votes. You cannot have any less than that, regardless of how, how few people live in your particular state. So on, on our map here, you can see current, current forecasts and projections. These will differ by media outlet. They'll differ from analyst to analyst. What I hope to do here with you today, Pete, we can go through and I'll show you where I, I would have the markets. I would have each state leaning. Uh, and we'll do this throughout the race in the next three and a half months till the election. Fantastic. Um, just before we get into that, uh, just, am I right in saying that uh, the margin of victory in each state is irrelevant? Um, for example, if Trump has a 0.1% margin over Biden in Florida, um, then would that mean that he receives all 29 votes from that state with Biden receiving zero? Great question, Pete. And, and, and most of the time, the answer is yes. There is a certain wrinkle to that. Uh, Maine and Nebraska, two states which are competitive at the, at the district level, they do not award all of their electoral votes to the winner of the statewide popular vote. We'll get to that in a moment, but in the other 48 states, the winner of the popular vote, you do not need an absolute majority. I want to point this out to your viewers. In many other countries around the world, you need to break 50%. In some statewide elections in America, you need to break 50%. Not the case with the presidency. You get the most votes in the state, you win all the votes. It's winner take all. Bar, Maine, and Nebraska. Maine and Nebraska, you, they are subdivided by congressional district. You win two, two electoral votes if you win the statewide vote, and then one electoral vote each for winning each congressional district. Both of those states, as, as, it, as it happens, usually is not the case, but Maine and Nebraska this year are competitive at the district level. Joe Biden has a great shot at winning one vote in Nebraska. Trump has an excellent shot at winning one vote in, in Maine, northern rural Maine. He did win this over Hillary Clinton by a size, sizable margin in 2016. I expect them to carry that again, which is why you'll see on your map there, both Maine and Nebraska are striped, which means we are projecting, I'm projecting as well, these states will be divided. But for the most part, your viewers are going to want to keep this in mind when forecasting or trading on this election. You, you win the statewide vote, you win all the electoral votes. doesn't matter whether you win by, by one or, or a million. 
Um, the 2016 election was won by Trump across a number of states, which many people didn't expect. Uh, would you mind highlighting these states for the viewers and um, explaining just how significant they will be uh, for the 2020 election? Absolutely, and, and that that'll, that leads us right into what, what we just talked about in terms of whether the margin is one vote or, or a million votes. Well, you'll see at the top of your screen here, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania moving from west to east. All were states that had gone Democratic in the past four or five presidential elections. Um, they'd been won by Al Gore, they were won by John Kerry, and they were also won by Barack Obama both times. Donald Trump slipped all three of them back into the red column but he did so by less, collectively less than 77,000 votes across three states. It's a very, very tiny margin in the nation of 350 million people. So Donald Trump swept all three, and as a consequence of that, he won 46 electoral votes, but he did so by, the, by a, a whisker, did so by a, a political bounce of a football, if you will. Very small margin. So his electoral margin over Hillary Clinton is quite sizable, it's over around 80 votes, but it, it is, that's exaggerated a bit by by the small margins in, by which he won each of those states. Uh, as a consequence, you'll see these are yellow on your map. These are where the battleground states, this is where the battle will unfold primarily in Joe Biden's quest to, re, to flip those states back into the Democratic column. Is, is it fair to say that people from uh, this region, I'm not sure whether you'd refer to that as the, the Rust Belt region, um, who have fallen upon yeah. tough times where, um, sold hope from Donald Trump in the 2016 election that he would bring back the manufacturing industries, more jobs, better conditions. Um, has there been enough of a change, I, I guess, and a revival uh, for the people of this region to uh, retain faith in Donald Trump and vote for him again in 2020? Whether enough will retain faith in Donald Trump r remains to be seen. There is some polling that suggests a fractional de deterioration in his support. Um, but you're absolutely right in your characterization. These three states are states that have witnessed the loss of jobs compared to what they had 30 or 40 years ago. They're aging populations. They're demographics that are favorable to Donald Trump, aging whiter electorates, uh, which by and large have a net outflow of college educated voters. Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin all have a, a, a net, they're exporting jobs of that magnitude. And these jobs are going down to this, what we call the Sun Belt from the Rust Belt. Arizona, North Carolina, Florida, uh, also Georgia. This is going to be a massive, uh, massive battlefield in American politics probably over the next eight to twelve years. That could really provoke a shift in the electoral map. Georgia may not be quite quite there yet. We're going to get to that a little bit later in your show, but that's that's one trend you want to look at. Those states, the three three you mentioned above there in the industrial rust belt, are moving away from the Democrats. And I think Joe Biden can win them. I think he's favored in at least two of them. But 10 or 20 years down the road, we might not be having the same conversation. Right. Okay. Um, one thing we haven't touched upon uh, with the first couple of episodes um, uh, is the war. Um, how is the war coming along? Um, and will that have an impact in, um, I guess, the border states of Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, that all appear to be, um, you know, to have the potential to swing either way between the Democrats and the, and the Republicans? It, that's an interesting question, Pete. And, you know, two years ago it would have been uh, really on point. Unfortunately, that, that has, or fortunately or unfortunately, depending on the Pony point of view, has really diminished in, in political dialogue in the United States. It's been overwhelmed by the pandemic. But it's also been overwhelmed because immigration, perhaps because of the pandemic, is not as much of a hot button issue and you're not seeing an influx of people coming into the United States as you, as you once were. That's, that's deteriorated rapidly. In those states that you mentioned, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, probably gonna get overwhelmed by, by COVID-19. Texas and Arizona currently are, are among the hardest hit, along with Florida, hardest hit states in the country. Uh, as far as the wall coming along, Donald Trump's changed his slogan, changed his slogan from, from build the wall to finish the wall. Unfortunately for Donald Trump, there's only about three miles of the wall and the 1800 mile border actually completed. Three miles out of 1800 is not exactly, not exactly progress. Um, his diehard supporters probably gonna be willing to give him a pass on that and they have their own reasons for supporting him. But I, 
I don't think it's going to be whether whether or not three miles or 300 miles of the wall were, were completed. I think you're just dealing with such a unique election here in terms of, of the COVID-19 that it won't be an issue. Okay. Um, so with the map that we have in front of us here, um, I guess most of the color coding here is determined uh, by recent polls. Would, would that be correct, Tavis? And um, uh, if that's the case, uh, I guess that's not always going to agree with, uh, with your opinion here. Um, why don't you have a go at, uh, at, at trying to predict what's actually going to take place with this election and we, we can see how many votes have we come to at the end? Absolutely. And this will, it bears pointing this out to your viewers, uh, this will differ media outlet by outlet. It'll differ analyst by analyst. Uh, for the most part, you're right. It is, it is it, it, colors will shift here. Or you will see colors shift here based on polls, but also based on historical trends. You'll see uh, lean, when, you, when you see pink on your screen, that means lean Republican. You'll see sky blue on your screen. That'll mean lean Democrat. Yellow would be 50-50 or perceived toss-up, which is close to a 50-50 race. I don't necessarily agree with all these, and we'll, we'll get to that in, in a bit here on our, my projections. But for, for the most part, historical trends do play a role here. And I'll point that out here in, on your map. You'll see Texas and Ohio. There have been polls showing Joe Biden leading in Texas and Ohio. There have been polls showing Joe Biden competitive in Iowa. The particular map we're using here, they have Joe Biden, they still have Texas and Ohio and Georgia, by the way, as lean red. Um, Georgia, there have been plenty of polls out of Georgia, Georgia to suggest that would be yellow. The reason you don't see them characterized as yellow on the screen is simply by virtue of historical trend. Ohio's drifted away from the Democrats rapidly in recent years. Georgia and Texas, although shifting toward the Democrats demographically, still a really, really hard sell. And just by virtue of historical trends, I think you'll see most analysts continue, including myself, they'll keep that in the Republican column, albeit lean. It won't be a solid Republican, but they won't move that to toss up just yet. Okay. So historical trends really, they play a strong, strong role here in prior elections. Right, okay. So in terms of, um 2016 election and, and the states that um, that Donald Trump had claimed um, as part of that election, which which of those states do you see as flipping towards uh, the Democrats uh, as, as part of the 2020 election? And do you happen to see any that may have been secured by Hillary Clinton um, in the previous election that might, for whatever reason, flip towards the Republicans? Both are, po both are possible, Pete. The first one is extremely possible. Uh, I'd say that the most likely ones will go in order here. The most likely ones to fall back into the Democrats column, I'd have to start with Michigan, right, up, right here at the top of the Rust Belt. Michigan has been really, really hit hard, Detroit specifically, by the pandemic. Uh, Trump's gotten a fight with the Michi Michigan governor over, over withholding resources to their state. Polls, I've, there have been plenty of polls showing Joe Biden with a double digit, really comfortable lead. Trump's got to be really careful here that Michigan isn't put away and, and privately some, some Republican party sources have, have confided that they, they, they see Michigan is already gone. So I'd see, I'll, I'll just move this in, on your map here to my current projections. I would put Michigan as lean Democratic. Pennsylvania, I would also characterize as lean Democratic, but for different reasons. Joe Biden comes from the Philadelphia region, he's from Senator from Wilmington, Delaware. He spent his entire career in the Philadelphia media market. He's also born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, he lived the first 10 years of his life there. So he's got a really strong presence in Eastern Pennsylvania and the Philadelphia region, which is the most populous part of the state. For that reason, I, I see Joe, Joe Biden as having something of a home court advantage here. He doesn't have as strong of a polling lead. Well, his polling lead's been very steady in Pennsylvania. We haven't had a lot of quality polls out of there, but been around five, five or six points with every, every poll you're taking. And for that, for that reason, five or six points plus coupled with Biden's home field advantage, which I don't feel is being reflected in the polls. I would also move that into the Democrats column. I'd be really, really surprised, barring a real suppression in, in Democratic turnout in the Philadelphia area. I see that going back to the Democrats as well. Those are your first two states, Pete. Excellent. Um, with, the, with the current pandemic, um, I understand that uh, a lot of these swing states are um, uh, quite heavily impacted. Um, Florida being one, Michigan being one, um, just how much um, of an impact will that have on voters, I guess? And um, you know, would you say that voters from these states are more likely to, um, uh, to be voting uh, for Joe Biden 
off the back of what's happened or uh, and will, will that play a significant part in, in who, who actually wins, wins those states? That, that's a million dollar question here in, in, in the US in terms of forecasting. It's something of a wild card because we, we truly don't know. And, and the reason we don't know is every state here has its own electoral process. Some are allowing full scale mail-in balloting. Texas is going to allow zero mail-in balloting unless you're over the age of 65. We really are, when it comes to a presidential election, we really are 50 nations under one flag. I can't take credit for that. Tip my cap there to Ford O'Connell, friend of mine in Washington, D.C. He's a good, good political analyst. Uh, his opinion I respect. That's his quote, not mine, so I will, I will credit him with that. But it's absolutely true. We, are, we, we really are 50 nations holding a separate elections on the same day, uh, which in terms, from terms of a trading perspective, it gives your viewers plenty to watch when we get into the state markets. I'd say about of the 50 states, probably 12 or 13, where we're going to have 12 or 13 where you're going to have a lot of trading activity where the outcome is not decided. By and large, where you see solid red or solid blue, barring a shock, we already know what the outcome is going to be. We know California and Oregon are going to vote for a Democrat. We know Mississippi and Wyoming are going to vote for a Republican. You don't, you don't, you don't, need, a, you don't need a degree in political science to forecast that. So. That said, you still, you, it is still 50 separate elections on the same day, and we will have a lot of interesting results to watch. So it really will, be, the, the turnout that you ask here, turnout question you ask, really will vary by the amount, uh, it'll vary by how severe the pandemic is on election day, first of all, hopefully less. And it'll also vary by how, how permissive each state is in allowing mail-in voting to occur. Now, in all the swing states, I do want to point out here on your, on your map, all the yellow states, you are allowed to vote, uh, no excuse absentee voting. You don't need to have a medical excuse. You don't need to have a work excuse. As long as you request a mail-in vote by the state, you're allowed to vote. You can, get, you can mail in your vote. You don't, need, you don't need an excuse. The problem is these states simply aren't equipped, many of them are not equipped to handle the sheer volume of mail that's going to come in with a rapid increase, probably from 35 to 50, 55% of your voters actually casting a ballot by mail. That's not normal in the United States. This is not a normal election year. So that for, for that reason, there's every chance we're not going to know the winner of the presidential on election night. We're going to have election week. We're not going to have election night. I don't think you're going to know the winner of the presidential election probably for two or three days. So because the vote counting will be so slow. 